Good evening, everyone. So I'm Professor Kevin Jones, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering, and I have the privilege and pleasure of welcoming you to tonight's talk. Um, before we get to the stuff you're actually here for, we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. So first of all, this talk is being presented in two ways. Those of you that I'm looking at are physically in the room and in-person information applies to you. The talk is also being streamed. And so there are a number of people watching it live on a stream. There'll be a separate set of instructions for them. So first of all, health and safety. You can see um, for online attendees, we're asking that you stay mute. Basically, so all of the attention is focused on Kerry, not on anyone else. And um, we're also trying to allow those online to ask questions. We're doing it via the Slido mechanism. If you don't know what that is, you've got a few minutes before the talk really starts to look it up. And you can see on the screen, can you see on the screen? No, those in the room can see on the, the wall what the Slido number is. Those of you online, I'm sure is visible to you somewhere and I have no idea where. So please do ask questions through Slido. So that way we can be fair to both those who are here and those who are not. Um, there is a chat function. That chat function will not be used for the Q&A session, just so it's clear. So if you're wondering why your question is not being answered, it's because people in the room wouldn't have seen it unless you use Slido. Okay, so that applies to the people who are online. To the people who are in the room, please keep your mobile phones off. Um, you can let them vibrate if you want. We don't mind that, but we'd prefer not to hear them. Okay. Second thing is for you, the fire exits matter. If you're online, getting out of your own house is your problem. If you were here, it's our problem. So fire exits at the back of the room, at the front of the room. If there is a fire alarm, please exit in an orderly fashion. We've got actually a relatively full house tonight. So let's try and sort of, if we need to, exit orderly and calmly. And then once you're outside, you'll basically be directed to where the safe gathering areas are. Of course, like in any other real emergency, what you'll do is follow somebody who looks like they know where they're going and you hope they're right. So um, if there is an emergency, that's where we find fire exits. Again, to keep things fair for those not here, we're using um, Slido to ask questions here as well. Hopefully all of you have mobile phones that will work for that. If not, maybe at the end of the evening, Richard, who's um, actually comparing the question and answer session, may take pity on the technologically challenged and take some questions in real time. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Um, I now get to give my sort of favorite academic speech, which you'll all be pleased to know is about a minute long, so you won't have to wait too long before getting the stuff you're really interested in. So tonight we're here for the inaugural professorial lecture of Professor Kerry Howell. Now, becoming a professor is actually a very significant event in an academic's career. It is the highest level of academic standing, which basically means you've been recognized as an international authority within your field. So it is a very significant step. One of the things a professor does is to profess, which means they are going to talk to you about what it is they're internationally expert in. Because they've achieved such wonderful heights, we make life really hard for them and they have to give a presentation that will be acceptable to the experts in their field who are sitting in the room and to the audience who are just really interested in what Kerry has to talk about and has absolutely no technical understanding whatsoever. So at the end of the evening, you get to judge how well that's been done. No pressure, Kerry, but <laughs> and I'm sure it'll be done wonderfully well. So. Please do enjoy the talk. Professorial inaugurals are open to the public deliberately, and hopefully we'll all learn something. I've been to many of these, and there's never been an occasion where I haven't learned something. So by the end of the evening, I hope that'll still be true. So I'll now pass you over to Professor Richard Thompson, who will give a detailed introduction to Kerry's talk. Thank you, Kevin.
Well, I, I'm not going to give that much detail because Kerry's the main event tonight and I want to give the time for her. I, I just wanted to say a, a few words really about, about Kerry and Kerry's research before she kicked off. Before even embarking on that, I, I wanted to say that, you know, that there's lots of things as Professor of Marine Biology and Director of the University's Marine Institute that I get to do. And I enjoy many of them. But actually, an event like tonight, celebrating the success of a fantastic colleague, is one of the most enjoyable tasks that I get to do in my university role. And I'm absolutely delighted, Kerry, to, to hear you speak in a minute. Now, I understand from Kerry, and she's been really organised in this, um, as she is in so many of the things. And she's, she's given me a page, which is a brief history of Kerry. And, and from that, so, some anecdotes come that, you know, her passion for the sea clearly came from a very early age. Um, and she talks about, you know, visits to the seaside, but also this delight in, to some extent, I think, challenging our own older brothers to swim a length underwater. And I don't know quite who won in that. I know some of her family are here tonight, and I think mum and dad are potentially tuned in live in Margate. So I hope you can hear as well, loud and clear in Margate. Kerry developed a passion for marine biology. She went to study BSc in marine biology at University of Swansea. She had the good fortune there of having one of the famous marine biologists as her tutor, Pete Haywood. And, and Haywood, with co-author Ryland also at Swansea, wrote one of the key textbooks. We sometimes refer to it as the Bible of marine biological identification. But those of you in the audience that are old enough to remember what a phone book looked like when we had those, you know, a great thick tome. Haywood and Ryland was two tomes about two and a half inches thick that was an identification, not to all of the marine fauna of Europe, but to quite a lot of it. So Kerry had the benefit of, of studying under, under Haywood and Ryland when she was in Swansea. She then went on to work at the National Museum of Wales, and that's where her passion for the deep sea really started to develop. She, she began to realise that that was where her heart lies. She went on then to study for a PhD at the University of, of Southampton, looking at deep sea starfish. And there she had the fantastic good fortune to work with Professor Paul Tyler, who was a professor of, of deep sea biology there for many years. In 2005, she won a really prestigious uh, UKRI fellowship to study human impacts on the marine environment. And she placed that fellowship here in Plymouth. And she's been here you know, to the delight of many of her colleagues in the audience since then. She's formed the uh, research group, the Deep Sea, uh, Deep sea Conservation Research Unit, Deep Sea Crew. She's got more than 60 publications to her name on this, on this topic. She's brought into the university more than £4 million in external funding. But along with all of that, she doesn't shy away in any respect from the everyday jobs of a university lecturer and a university professor. She doesn't have sloppy shoulders and go and hide in a room and just pursue her science. No, she leads some of the most substantial modules of teaching in the university. She leads international field courses. She led a major degree program for five years. And she's incredibly well respected and liked by the students for her work as a university lecturer. But more broadly than that, um, she serves on international committees for International Council for Exploration of the Seas and OSPAR. And she served on uh, committees for some of the major funding agencies as well. These are tasks that you don't have to do, but they're of real benefit to all of the other scientists in the university that she participates in those. I would say Kerry is often one that's prepared to put her hand up and say yes to a job when others in the room are probably sitting on their hands. And it's particularly that alongside that excellent science that we're going to hear about tonight that means for me you're such a fantastic colleague. Kerry said to me in her piece about the history of Kerry that as a kid she wanted to save the world. I think she still wants to save the world and I think we're going to hear in a minute about some of the ways that she's still doing that. So thank you Kerry and without more ado I'll hand over to you. Thank you. You've got your own mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. I'm going to check. Thank you so much, Richard. That was really, really, really kind. Thank you. What a lovely introduction. Um, I, I think my mic's working. Um, so, oh, where to begin? Well, um, I, want, I wanted to start by saying thank you, um, actually. I, I wanted to thank my family 
my husband, my children, for um, being very, very supportive of my career and tolerating mummy disappearing to sea for a few weeks at a time when I go out to sea. Um, and thanks, thanks to my parents. I hope they are listening online. I think they are. They can crack the technology. Um, but I also wanted to thank my research group, both um, past and present members, the Deep Sea crew. Um, I know a lot of them are in the room today, and I know a lot of them are online. So, um, Because a lot of the work I'm going to talk to you about today is teamwork. It's not, it's not just mine. Um, it's, it's actually all of my team's work, um, and I'm incredibly proud of them. Um, there's a lot of other people that I wanted to say thank you for. Um, and I was going to try and put them on a slide, but the list was getting ridiculously long. Um, and so I thought I'd just say thank you, but I actually found it difficult to say thank you. So I'm just going to put a slide up, which I'd like you to read, um, and I'll just say thank you. Okay. Um, now I'll lighten the mood with uh, a picture of a man hugging a dolphin, which a friend of mine <laughs> challenged me to get into my talk, and I'm just saying I've done it. <laughs> um, so just to give you a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a bit more detail on, on my education, my pathway to where I am now and, and the um, work experience, the postdoctoral experience that I had to get here, um, before then spending the rest of the talk telling you about what my research is um, and telling you about the different aspects of it. So I'll talk to you about um, broad scale habitat mapping, about fine scale habitat mapping, uh, how that is applied to um, marine spatial planning and um, and then some work we're moving into now which is trying to link habitats to people uh, and some of the future directions of my research. So I'll start at the beginning which is in my BSc which as Richard said was at um, the University of, of Wales in Swansea and um, that's a picture of me during my degree um, doing what all good marine biologists should do getting muddy um, and being out on a boat. Um, but after my degree, oh, I've got it up already. Uh, my first job <laughs> upon leaving my degree was in a shampoo factory, okay? Which, see, which is not somewhere where a marine biologist wants to find themselves. But I wanted to make the point to all the young people out there doing their degrees today or, or coming to the end of that degree program that, you know, you might not walk into a job in marine biology. And that's okay, right? Because um, there's always time and you can keep trying and you can get experience and you can get into the field. So I did eventually manage to get a job doing something relevant, and it was as a polychaete taxonomist working um, at the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. So these are polychaetes, they're marine worms, they're incredibly beautiful. I'm very biased, but I love them. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work with someone who, who was teaching me how to identify them properly um, and which species are which. Um, and then I, I knew, though, at that point that I did want to continue my education. I wanted to do a PhD. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to, to get a PhD um, at the National, no, it was the Southampton Oceanography Centre at the time, now the National Oceanography Centre Southampton, uh, which is there. <laughs> um, which is when I, I went to start my PhD uh, in, in 1999. Okay, and my PhD, as Richard mentioned, was on the ecology of deep sea starfish. So the um, Institute of Oceanographic Sciences, as it was then, a government research lab, had moved to Southampton and merged with part of Southampton University to form Southampton Oceanography Centre. But they had been um, undertaking work out in a place called the Porcupine Sea Bite, which is a, a well, I'll show you where it is in a minute. Um, They've been working in that area for 25 years, undertaking trawls and bringing back specimens and had a, um, a collection called the Discovery Collection of uh, around 25 years worth of, of sampling. And I was tasked with looking at the starfish part of that collection. And the title of my PhD was very vague, um, The Ecology of Deep Sea Starfish. But I, I really loved that. So I was open open and free to do whatever I wanted um, with all these 25 years worth of starfish. Um, and so I'll just, oh, this is, there we go. Um, so the place was the Porcupine Sea Bite and Porcupine Abyssal Plain, which is this area just here off of Ireland. And you can see in the map uh, all my data, so all the trawl samples I was using and where all the starfish had come from. And so I ecologied the heck out of the deep sea starfish. So uh, 
I looked at their diversity and their distribution. So I looked at 41 different species of starfish and how they were distributed down the depth gradient and how their abundance changed uh, over that depth gradient. I looked at their diversity and how the number of species of starfish changed as he went down the depth gradient with most species occurring at around 1500 meters and then again a big peak down on the abyssal plain at five kilometers down. Um, I also looked at the communities of starfish as you went down the slope and looked for pattern in how those communities were distributed and found that a bit like a rocky shore when you're looking at the top of the shore, you'll see lots of lichens and things like that. When you look at the bottom of the shore, you'll maybe see the kelps and things like that. There's a zonation on the shore. There's a zonation in the deep sea. So we see patterns of organisms change as you go down the depth gradient. Um, and those patterns correspond to the physical characteristics of, of the environment. So they correspond to things like water mass structure. Um, and you get these patterns and bands of organisms. I looked at their diet, I dissected their stomachs out, looked at what they'd been eating, looked at the pigment concentrations in their gut, saw what kinds of algae they'd been eating, um, looked at their fatty acid composition of them, which tells you something about who's eating who uh, and where their dietary um, supplements are coming from, whether they're predators or whether they're scavengers or suspension feeders. I looked at their phylogenetics, which is sort of a posh word for DNA fingerprinting, um, to look at how closely related different species were and whether these three individuals were actually one species or three species. Spoiler alert, they were three species. Um, I looked at their reproduction. I dissected out their gonads and sectioned them and stained them. This is a, a, a section through a gonad that's been stained so you can see all the eggs growing here. So I could look at their reproductive strategies. And I looked at their physiology. I looked at the, the lipid composition of the membrane structure of the cells, um, which was really just looking at how well they were adapted to living at different depths and particularly the different pressures that they live under. Because the deep sea, um, well, the marine environment, with every 10 meters you go down, pressure increases by one atmosphere. So these things are living at very different pressures uh, and different places on the slope. And I spent a lot of time uh, well, not that much time, but I went to sea quite a bit during my PhD. I went out to sea four times, um, mostly on this ship Discovery, um, doing this sort of thing. So trawling on the seabed, bringing back big old bags of mud from the abyssal plain, hosing out the mud, and then looking at what species we found, things like these sea cucumbers that you can see here. But I was also very fortunate to get an opportunity to go in a manned submersible. The submersible is called the Johnson Sea Link. Oh, my video is not playing. That's awkward. Give it a minute. There you go. So this is me uh, in the Johnson Sea Link. It's this big submersible, which is a big glass ball that you sit in. You can see the size of the smile on my face. Uh, it remains one of the coolest things I've ever had the pleasure of doing. But we went to this place called the Brine Lake, which is what it sounds like. It's an underwater lake. It's been on Blue Planet too, so I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen it. Um, that's the Johnson Sea Link looking out over the lake. Um, and the shore of the lake is covered in these, these mussel beds. It's incredibly amazing. Um, and yeah, certainly something I, I won't forget any time soon. Really, really amazing experience. Nothing to do with my PhD. I just got to go in the deep sea and I get bragging rights. So after I finished my PhD, I worked um, as a postdoc, as many people do, still at the Oceanography Centre on a project called the Census of Marine Life. This was a 10 year programme to study marine life. It was global in scope um, and I was hired again to work on the Discovery Collection. So it was my job, that's me in the collection there, um, to curate that collection and database it and make that information available to other scientists around the world. And I was also databasing um, old um, sample records that were all been typed, um, uh, you know, because um, the computers hadn't long been around. Um, and I was databasing these uh, information on these gelatinous animals called siphonophores, uh, working with a chap called Martin Angel, uh, who was an expert on those. But when I finished that postdoc, I was a little bit disillusioned with academia. 
um, and partly because of something Richard alluded to, which is I got into this because I wanted, as many young people, I wanted to save the planet. Um, and I genuinely couldn't see how what I was doing was helping. Um, I couldn't see that it was in any way contributing. I was enjoying myself, but it, I wasn't sure I was really doing anything to help. And so I went to work for government. Um, for an organisation called the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, who are advisors to DEFRA on matters of nature conservation. Now, what had happened um, at the start of my PhD, so if you look at the date on this uh, press release, um, this happened at the very beginning of my PhD, and I was aware of it because my adopted supervisor, Alex Rogers, was involved in this court case. So Greenpeace had taken the UK government to court for not applying something called the Habitats Directive in all of, U of UK waters. It was only applying it in the very coastal waters of the UK. Greenpeace took them to court and said they should be applying it to all of the UK, and they won. Um, now, this is the UK's marine area, the area inside the red line. So at that point, UK government were only really applying the Habitats Directive out to the blue line. Uh, which is the 12 nautical mile limit. The court case meant they had to apply it out to the red line. And you'll notice that's quite a lot of deep sea. Um, and I went to work for JNCC just when they were being tasked with trying to implement the Habitats Directive in this very deep water area. The Habitats Directive, um, I won't go into the detail of it, but basically what it required EU member states and the UK at the time to do was to put in place um, marine protected areas to protect particular habitats and species like some of those you can see here. Um, those marine protected areas are called special areas for conservation, but they're essentially a type of marine protected area. And it wasn't just one, they had to come up with a network of marine protected areas called the Natura 2000 network. And so my job when I was at JNCC was to try and help decide where these MPAs should be. Where in this great space should we put an MPA and, and have some basis for those decisions? Another aspect of my job while I was there was looking at um, the way in which we describe habitats, habitat classification. So I was involved in the revision of the UK's um, marine habitat classification for, for Britain and Ireland, actually. Um, and I was involved in revising the, the sediment section because I'd been working with sediments for a while, working with these worms that live in sediments. So I was very familiar with those kinds of habitats. And so I, I helped revise this, this section at the time. Um, but it wasn't long before I realised that there was a very big research gap. When I was looking for information to help decide where these MPAs should be, there really wasn't any. Um, the deep sea wasn't really a place where there was information available that would help someone in government decide where a marine protected area should be. And similarly, the habitat classification that I showed you just didn't apply in the offshore. <laughs> it only really worked coastally. The minute you went offshore, there, was, there, wasn't, there weren't any habitats, apparently. There were none described. So I saw um, uh, an advertisement for a, a, a position here at Plymouth University, which was something called a, a, an RCUK fellowship, which, which Richard mentioned. And these were very unique positions that were only available for a very short period of time, more's the pity. They were five-year fellowships um, that offered a more stable route for postdoctoral scientists into, um, into full-time employment. So they were a five-year fellowship, and the university had to guarantee a permanent lectureship at the end of them. And it was a position that was actually advertised um, working on human impacts on the marine environment um, for someone to come to Plymouth and do work as an independent research fellow in that area. Um, and so that's what I did. I came to Plymouth on that fellowship um, working on human impacts on the marine environment. I'm having clicker problems. Let me try again. There we go. So that five-year fellowship um, was a very busy time, but it wasn't very productive in terms of publishing any papers. And there's a very good reason for that. I'd published pretty much everything I had to publish from my PhD and my postdocs. I've been working for government for two years, not, not generating any new science, just trying to advise government. Um, and so I didn't have any new data to work with. Now, collecting deep sea data 
is actually really time consuming and difficult. Firstly, you have to get some funding to get a ship. Then your ship has to go out and collect some data. And that, that takes at least a year to even plan that. Um, and then you have to process that data, which biodiversity data takes a long time to process, uh, before you actually have something that you can look at and say something about. So um, I wrote a lot of reports during that time. So I wrote a report for Natural England on MPAs. I've been working on it for two years, so I knew exactly what to say about that. I did some contract work for the Department of Trade and Industry, who at the time were undertaking something called strategic environmental assessment of the entire UK. And this was really to provide a baseline to support their licensing of oil and gas exploration in UK waters. Um, and I was asked to um, work on strategic environmental assessment area seven, which is this very deep water areas here. And then I also did a bit of, of four, working with my colleagues in, South Ham um, in uh, SAMS up in Scotland. So we uh, went and had a cruise and wrote up all the data from, from one year. And then they realized it was such a big area, we needed at least another year working on this. So we did another year working on this, um, exploring this whole area that um, hadn't really been explored too much before because it was so far offshore, some of it. Um, I also won my first uh, grant as principal investigator during this time from the Esme Fairburn Foundation to work on applying an ecosystem approach to deep water fisheries. Um, and this was really the first time I got into modeling and it was food web modeling, but it was food web modeling to understand the impacts of fisheries on the wider ecosystem. Um, and so that, again, was working with colleagues uh, at SAMS. I also got involved in a project called MESH, Mapping European Seabed Habitats, which was um, a, a European-wide project aimed at trying to provide maps of the seabed, of where different habitats are. Um, and I continued to work with JNCC um, on surveying and understanding this, this area west of Scotland uh, and the deep sea region. Um, and I should have said that I was taken onto this fellowship actually by uh, Martin Atchville, who's in the audience today, and, and also um, the late Lawrence Mee, Professor Lawrence Mee. Um, so I'm grateful to them. I also had two children during this time, which was another reason why I wasn't incredibly productive in terms of papers. Um, so that took up a bit of time as well. But all of this work, um, all of the things I'd done looking at um, mapping habitats, trying to make decisions about where to put MPAs in deep water, thinking about human use in terms of fisheries and oil and gas, um, really consolidated my interest and my research line, which is really focused on spatial management of the deep sea. It's about trying to provide the science to enable people to make uh, science-informed decisions about where we should and shouldn't do things in this really deep water environment. And so when you're thinking about taking decisions about how we use space and where different things are, um, it inevitably involves mapping. Um, but the question is what to map. The term habitat means different things to different people <laughs> and it operates at many different scales. Okay, so the question is what, what can we map? Um, and I've got a nice picture of the moon up there, because I'm sure you've heard the expression, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep sea, right? Which is clearly not true. Um, but the point is, the deep sea is a data poor environment in comparison to shallow waters. We don't have a huge amount of information and we're being asked to make decisions about human use of this area. Um, and so the challenge for me was how can we map biologically meaningful habitats in the deep sea when we don't really have a lot of biological data. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is by mapping biological variation. So we can't map the habitats and species themselves, but what we can do is map the things that we know influence differences in species and habitats and how those change. And so that's the approach we've been using. And this is what we call broad scale habitat mapping. So I knew from my PhD work that the fauna of the deep sea are zoned by depth. We know they change in a, in a predictable way and it corresponds very much to water mass structure, but we actually know the depths at which these horizons occur. 
And I knew from my work in the DTI and actually from my PhD that in UK waters, we've really got two faunas in the deep sea. We've got an Arctic fauna and an Atlantic fauna, and they're very, very different. And so at its most basic form, if you carved up the UK's deep sea into an Arctic, which is the blue in that uh, picture up there. Have I got a laser pointer? Maybe. Um, and the Atlantic, which is the pink in the picture over there. If you just carve the UK's uh, deep sea area up in that way, you would want to make sure that you had an MPA in the blue area and in the pink area to be confident that you'd captured the Arctic and the Atlantic fauna, which we know are different. OK, but also we know about that depth donation. So if you carve the UK's deep sea up into different depth bands like this, you would probably want to make sure that you have representation of each of the different types of depth band in your MPA network if what you're hoping to do is represent all the different faunal variation in your MPA network. And so if you mash those two things together, you get a new map which combines the two approaches. And you can use that map to try and help you place where your MPA should be if your purpose of your MPAs was to try and represent all of the different faunal types that you have in the UK. But we know more than that. Um, we know there are other things that influence the um, fauna in the UK, one of which is substrate type. So we know the animals that live on rock are not the same as the animals that live on sediment. And there is a grading of communities in between the very hard substrate and the very soft substrate. So if you have a map of bottom substrate type, which we did happen to have, um, then you can also use that in consideration of your mapping as well. So if you merge that substrate type map into your existing map, you get something that looks like this. And the idea here then is that each of these different classes, each of these different boxes and colours in the map is representing a different faunal community based purely on the fact that we know these environmental parameters change the types of communities that you see. And so this type of approach was taken up by government and used, oops, and used to produce a new seabed habitat map. So UK government had uh, produced something called UK Sea Map back in 2006, and it looked like this. You'll notice there's a big blank for the deep sea. <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, the only deep sea bit that is included is really poor resolution um, map. And they took uh, my work and incorporated it into an update to the UK Sea Map um, to produce this new version in 2010. Um, and so now we have a complete habitat map for UK waters that can be used to help inform spatial management and MPA network design. So we've done this approach in lots of different places. There are lots of ways of doing it. I've shown you the most simple way. There's more complex modeling ways of, of doing this type of thing. And we've tried different methods in different places. But one of the ones I want to mention is, is one of the ones we've done quite recently. And this is work by Kirsty McQuaid, who was my PhD student, now postdoc. Um, and she was working in an area called the clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone in the Pacific. So you can see from the map of the world down there what a large area it is. And this area lies between two fracture zones, clarion Fracture Zone and the Clipperton Fracture Zone. It's not a clever name. Um, but this whole area has been licensed for deep sea mining exploration by the International Seabed Authority, who are the UN body that are responsible for licensing deep sea mining in what we call areas beyond national jurisdiction or the high seas, the bit of the sea that nobody owns. Um, and so Kirsty um, worked on doing a similar approach, taking um, the different environmental variables that we know influence the faunal composition in this region. We know topography is important. We know uh, the amount of food available is important to the animals and it changes the community structure across the abyssal plain. And we know that the density of manganese nodules, which is the thing that, that, that people are trying to mine, is also really important in determining community structure. And so by taking this approach again, um, looking at classifying these layers into different ways, Kirsty was able to produce a habitat map for this region. And she looked at the MPA network that the ISA had put in place. These boxes you can see called APEIs, areas of particular environmental interest, 
um, Kirsty was able to use her habitat map to assess that MPA network and say, is it really representing the variation in the region? Um, and she found that it wasn't. It wasn't. It had missed out some important habitats, notably the areas of very dense nodules were not contained within the MPA. Um, but what's really nice is that Kirsty's work was taken up by the ISA um, and they looked at her work. She published her paper um, and we worked with the ISA and other scientists as well. It wasn't just our work, um, but it's led to the ISA proposing new areas of particular environmental interest. So new MPAs in the Clarion Clipperton, um, which Kirsty's papers and, and work directly influenced their decisions on that process. Okay, um, oh, but I'll go back. There was a problem, I forgot to mention the problem. So the problem was that the, the method that we'd used for doing this piece of work um, meant that if you wanted to extend the map, which we did want to extend the map, because you'll notice this APEI 12 goes off Kirsty's map. Um, it actually was very difficult to extend the map to a new area because of the method we'd used. Now, the method we'd used was, was a really nice, robust method, um, but it made it very difficult to widen it out. And so what we concluded was that what we really need is a whole map of the world for this. And that's pretty much what we're doing now. So at the moment, my team are working on a habitat map for the whole world. Um, we're using a variety of methods, and that's being done as part of two separate programs, the One Ocean Hub, which I'm um, um, involved with, and Mission Atlantic, which is an EU-funded program. Um, I've only shown the South Atlantic here because we have a particular interest in the South Atlantic, but we're trying to find ways of producing a single global habitat map for the marine environment um, to help inform spatial management, but particularly in areas beyond national jurisdiction because national bodies will make their own maps and that's fine. But in those areas outside of national jurisdiction, what do we do there? So that's what we're working on at the moment. But I want to come on to now fine scale habitat mapping because actually broad scale is really useful, particularly for assessing things like representativity or representation of different habitats. But sometimes what you really want is information at the fine scale. So there may be particular habitats that are important to you or that may be particularly vulnerable to human activities, and what you want to know is where those are. Um, so a, an important component of doing that is having habitats described. So I brought us back here to the habitat classification system that I worked on when I was at JNCC. And you can see how the system works. Level one is marine. Um, level two breaks the world up into depth bands, literal, circle, literal, sub-literal, but also sediment type, hard sediment, rock or um, soft sediments. Level three breaks it up further um, into um, different um, sediment types, so different grain sizes of sediment. And then level four is where the biology comes in and it gives you that real biological detail. And you can see there's some, some habitats that I hope you might recognise. So we've got mill beds and there's a picture of, of, of a mill bed there, which may, many of you may be familiar with, but also sublateral seagrass beds. Um, and you can see a, a, we, we have those in Plymouth Sound. So these are habitats you might be familiar with and they're really well described and characterised in the UK uh, habitat classification system. Um, for the deep sea, they're not even described. So we can't map habitats until we've described what those habitats are that we're trying to map. And so a large part of my career to date has been focused on describing those deep sea habitats. Now it seems really trivial, but that's where we are in deep sea sciences, identifying what are those habitats. So there are, there are some that we're kind of happy exist, things like cold water coral reef, which I'll introduce you to in a moment. But there are other habitat types that are less familiar, a little bit more um, poorly described, should we say. And so we've written a series of papers that have tried to describe deep sea habitats. And that really culminated in, um, in a piece of work in 2015 that we did working with government, where we essentially came up with an entirely new section for the UK's marine habitat classification, specifically for the deep sea, um, which was 
published in 2015. Okay, and you can see um, that classification here. So it's an extension to the one that I've shown you so far, but it includes then all of the deep sea. And you'll notice that described within that is the Atlantic fauna and the Arctic fauna. Um, we also have the depth bands, upper, middle, lower. So it's totally derived from the work that I did. Um, and then um, within that, then we have descriptions of actual biological communities, the most obvious of which is cold water coral reef. And my video is also not playing. Again, I wonder if you would mind. No, not happening. It's not happening. OK, <laughs> you miss out on the beautiful coral reef. Never mind. Oh, look, it flashed up. There it is. OK, now you can see it. Great. Um, so this is a cold water coral reef. It's a, a, a really important habitat in the deep sea. Um, it forms a habitat for many other species, has important roles as nursery ground, feeding ground for lots of taxa. You can see here Mr. Crabs going for a stroll um, amongst the coral, but really, really beautiful habitat, but very, very delicate, vulnerable. You can imagine if a, if a trawl goes through that, um, it's completely destroyed. So this is about 700 metres deep now off of um, Ireland and the UK. There's quite a lot of these reef habitats. So having defined habitat types, um, we could then think about mapping them and understanding where they were. Um, so these are just a few examples of the types of habitats that we've spent some time on trying to map where they are. Um, now, I'm going to go all sciencey on you for a minute. <laughs> But it's because I want you to kind of understand the concept, at least, of how we do this. Um, and it's, it's based on, it's a, it's a type of modelling. But essentially, it's, it's really conceptually quite basic. If we know where a habitat occurs, we know cold water coral reef, we know it likes to be on rugged ground, it likes to be in cold water, we know the sorts of temperatures it likes to be at, we know the sorts of sediment it likes to be on, likes to be on bedrock, we know the sorts of depths it's at. Um, then what we can say is that, OK, we know the suite of environmental conditions it likes to live under. So if we see that exact same set of environmental conditions somewhere else, we can predict it's likely that we'll find cold water coral reef. And that's how this works. And to get all very mathsy on you, imagine for a moment you had surveyed down the depth gradient. And at the shallow depths, I've seen one cold water coral reef. As I went a bit deeper, I saw two. As I went a bit deeper, I saw three. Saw another three as I went deeper, saw another three. Went even deeper and I only saw two. And then I went even deeper and I only saw one. What it looks like there is there is a relationship between the frequency of seeing a, a cold water coral reef, the number of times you see it, and the depth. And that relationship looks like this. Okay, I can plot a line through that relationship once you have a line, you have the power. Because now, what I know is that if I go to any depth on there, I can work out what is the uh, number of coral reefs I'm going to see, or put it another way, the probability of me seeing a coral reef at that depth. And that's really how this works. That's how the modelling works. Now, that's just one variable, and this is a regression-based model. But we use lots of environmental variables, and we don't just use regression. We use other kinds of modeling methods. And I just want to point out that maths is cool. It is cool, because you can do this with it. So that's how that kind of mapping works. So we've done a lot of work in trying to produce maps of where different habitats are found, these very fine scale habitats. Um, so, as an example, then, this is an area west of Scotland and Ireland. It's Rockall Bank. It's part of UK Deep Sea. Um, and we've done some survey there using acoustic methods. So we use sound to look at the shape of the seabed. It's a method called multi-beaming. And you can see the detail map here of the edge of the bank, just what the edge of the bank looks like. And all the little dots are video transects from our um, towed camera systems and robotic systems that I'll talk about later. Um, and so with that information, then, we can look at where the different habitats are on those maps. And then we can make our models of how they're distributed across that area based on these environmental relationships. And this is some work by um, one of my postdocs. He was a research assistant at the time, um, Niels Pieschel. 
Um, but you can produce these maps then of where the different habitats are. And this is a very local scale map. And get it eventually. Oh, too far. Um, OK, and then we've done this at a national level as well. These are national scale models of the distribution of cold water coral reef throughout the UK and Ireland's waters and of a type of sponge aggregation, deep sea sponge aggregation in these areas as well. And this is work by Rebecca Ross, who's now working in Norway, a former member of my group. And we've done this at a basin scale as well. So we can think about the whole of the North Atlantic and we can make models of where different habitats are. And this is a model of different um, sponge aggregations. And it's actually three different models because you can then put all those models together and see where they agree. And that gives you a better understanding of whether you're right or wrong. Um, so this can help us identify areas where these habitats are. Um, and lately, we've moved to a new angle in this type of approach where we've been thinking about the wider UK area. So for those of you who don't know, the UK has many overseas territories um, which collectively give it the third largest, not the third, the sixth largest marine area in the world. Um, but some of these areas are in places that are really, really poorly known. Uh, the North Atlantic is relatively well explored. The South Atlantic is extremely poorly known. Um, and so um, some of the UK overseas territories in the South Atlantic, um, Ascension Island, St Helena, Tristan da Cunha, there's really no data on the deep sea fauna for these regions at all. Um, and so what we've been trialling, and this is work by uh, Amelia Bridges, who uh, uh, did this as part of her PhD, she's now a postdoc in my group, um, is to take our North Atlantic models. So we look out the relationships between our habitat and all those environmental parameters and we know what happens in the North Atlantic, and then make a prediction into the South Atlantic to see where we think cold water coral reef is going to be in this case. And so this is a map that Amelia produced around Tristan da Cunha, which shows the areas where cold water coral reef is highly likely to be based on our North Atlantic models. Um, and so, and, and they're, they're not bad, I have to say. They're not bad models. We have tested them. Um, and this is some work we've been doing with our partners at CFAS um, and also the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, it's, it's a programme called the Blue Belt Project, which is led by uh, the MMO and CFAS, the Marine Management Organisation and CFAS, but it's funded by the, the um, FCDO. Um, now, we've done a whole load of other work that I'm not really going to talk about, um, but other questions about marine spatial planning and particularly MPA network design. So we've asked questions about um, how much area should be contained in an MPA network to ensure that ecosystems still function well. And this is work by Nicola Foster in my group, um, who's now actually an independent researcher in her own right. Um, we've done work on looking at how well connected these MPA networks are. So our larvae, the juveniles of, of animals able to move between them freely. Um, and this is, again, work by Rebecca Ross, uh, who's now in Norway. Um, so how well connected are the MPA networks? And then we've done some work as well in taking lots of different layers of information. So habitat maps, broad scale, um, fine scale, dealing with particularly vulnerable communities, looking at the connectivity models, and also looking at information on human use. So where are we fishing, for example? And putting all that information together into um, spatial management scenarios and looking at, well, you know, what's the best MPA network we can have that avoids um, moving fishes out of their grounds and captures all of the vulnerable habitats in this sort of spatial planning software. So we've done work on that, and that's John Evans's work, who's now, I think it's Southampton. Um, so we've done a lot of work on mapping. But the thing is that what matters to people is what those habitats do for people. So we really need to be thinking about the services that those habitats provide to people in order to make it more meaningful to um, government decisions more than anything. Um, and so ecosystem services are things like um, carbon sequestration, so locking up of carbon to help mitigate climate change, or things like marine genetic resources, so looking for um, novel compounds and chemicals and things that maybe have medical properties. Um, and there's lots of other services in there. So 
this is something we've started to consider. Um, and we consider that particularly we've, we've been working around Ascension, looking at the um, services provided by Ascension Islands, deep water habitats. But it's also then about how human impacts impact upon those habitats and then impact upon those services and how vulnerable those habitats are to human activities. And so we've been thinking about vulnerability of these habitats to different human activities. And this is work we've been doing with Olivia Langmead uh, and colleagues at the MBA. Um, and then taking it to its full um, back to people, it's about how humans, um, human impacts, human activities impact on the habitats, then impact on the services, and then those services impact on people. So if climate change isn't being effectively mitigated, then um, we have global warming, which we have obviously anyway, but that impacts on people is the point. These things impact on people. Um, if we run out of antibiotics, uh, which is a real risk that antibiotics are, are no longer going to work effectively, then that starts to really impact people. And if marine life can potentially provide a solution there, then um, it has a value to people in the form of new medicines. So we've been starting to think about ecosystem services and the connections between people and deep sea habitats. And this is work we've been doing under our project, the One Ocean Hub. And it's really working with Sean Rees and, and her team, who are really the experts on ecosystem services and the links to people. Um, but it's been really great to work together on trying to look at different aspects of this problem. My area of focus remains the ecology. So I'm still interested in the habitat maps and also the services provided by those habitats. Um, and so it, it's really obvious that we need more work in this area. Um, so some of the work that we've been starting to do is working with other colleagues at the university. So working with um, Matt Upton and his group on antimicrobial resistance. Um, and essentially, I give Matt samples from the seabed of things like sponges, which are very interesting. You can see how we pick these things up here using robotic technology. Um, and I give them to Matt, and he looks for new antibiotics in it. And, and this is work that's been done by um, our PhD students, our shared PhD students, Poppy and Matt, and um, now Jazz and also Kudzai are all working on this um, issue. But we've also been considering then that carbon sequestration angle. So how are marine habitats helping to lock up carbon? Um, and we've been working again with colleagues at British Antarctic Survey and CFAS in looking at the role particularly of things like cold water coral reef in locking up carbon and therefore serving to help mitigate climate change. Um, and that's an area that's really important going forward. We all know we're facing a, a, a huge challenge with climate change. Um, and so we need to do some work on looking at the value of these different deep sea habitats and species in mitigating climate change and locking up and sequestering carbon. So things like cold water coral reef, the structures are, are, are calcium carbonate. They persist for thousands of years and therefore are locking up carbon. But also individual corals, like these big pink bubblegum corals you can see, and also the black corals over there, which is in fact orange, but the skeleton's black. These corals live for hundreds to thousands of years and therefore are also locking up carbon simply by existing. But then there's other organisms like these beautiful glass sponges in the deep sea, which um, take in dissolved inorganic carbon and the bacterial component within them is actually really effective at transforming inorganic carbon into organic carbon. And we need to investigate these further as to whether they have a role in carbon sequestration um, in this habitat. Um, so we can work out things like how much carbon are in these things. Um, and then we could use our maps to say, well, here are the areas where these habitats are. But actually, if you want to quantify which areas may be more important in locking up carbon, you actually need to know more. You need to know about the biomass of these animals, and you need to know about the densities, the numbers of these animals. So you don't just want, is it here or is it not here? presence, absence maps. You actually need maps that tell you about how much biomass is there and um, how many animals are there, the abundance and density of these animals. So that's really where we're going to now, is we're trying to move our maps away from just presence, absence, 
I mean, presence of absence is really important, um, but we also want to be looking at the quantification of that. We want to be looking at the biomass and we want to be looking at the densities of these animals. But that's really, really data intensive. To do those kinds of models, we need a lot more data um, to, on, on the numbers and the biomass of these organisms. Um, and that's the challenge, is how do we generate that data? Um, now, I haven't said much about the platforms that we use to collect this kind of data. We use, these days, a lot of robotic platforms, um, um, uh, remotely operated vehicles and autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, to collect this kind of data. And you can see the size of these vehicles. That's me standing next to Holland One, which is the Irish National ROV. They are enormous vehicles equipped with um, robotic arms and uh, very important in exploring the deep sea. Um, you can see one being deployed off the side of a vessel there. And this just gives you an idea again of the scale. This is the control room for one of these robots. Um, you can see at the front there, lots of screens and three pilots in, in the top image there. Uh, it takes three pilots to fly these things, one to fly, two to operate the arms. Um, and then further back in the room, there's another set of screens, and that's where the scientists sit and direct op operations. So we'll be sitting in the back, recording information and saying to the pilots, could you go over there, please? Can you pick that animal up, please? Um, and that's how that works. And you can see there the scientist booth with me sat in the middle doing my best Cousteau impression, um, directing the science. Um, and so getting the data isn't a problem. These robots, and particularly the autonomous robots, can stay down for hours and hours, um, days even, and collect images from the seafloor, video from the seafloor, huge quantities of information. The problem occurs when you come back, is that some wonderful human, which used to be me but is now my team, uh, has to sit and identify all the animals and count them and draw circles around them to generate that biological data that we need. And that, let me tell you, is a really difficult task and it's incredibly time consuming. And my God, um, you only have to ask the dear people at the back of the room from my team how painful that is. You can only really do it for a few hours and then, and then you go insane. Um, so that's the problem. This takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of expertise, and it's extremely tiring, and you can only do so much a day. So to generate the kinds of data sets that we need from these images, we are starting to look at using computer vision. So this is a type of artificial intelligence, um, and the very specific branch we're using is something called deep learning. Um, and um, it's used in self-driving cars. It's not new, it's fine, it's been around for a while. It's just not really been applied to identifying deep sea animals. Um, so they use it for things like looking at sporting events and monitor what players are doing and analysing data. Um, and so we've been doing work in this field and again collaborating within the university with a chap from computing and maths called Dr Chin Chu Lee, um, who's an expert on artificial intelligence and has been really helpful in helping us do this. Um, but also working with external people who are experts in programming. Um, and we would not be able to do this without their help. It's really impenetrable for ecologists. Um, so I'm grateful to um, um, David Hutchinson, um, who's been helping us do this, and also uh, Chris um, Hunt, who helped us previously as well. So this is work that's being led, again, by my postdoc, Nils Pieschel, who's been working on the application of artificial intelligence to image analysis and has done some preliminary work to understand how well these algorithms perform at identifying species. Um, and what he basically found was that for some species, they do really, really well. They, they get great performance, sort of 90% accuracy, fantastic. For other species, not so well at all, 30% sort of accurate. Uh, really, really bad. So it, it definitely can work. And this work's been taken up more recently by a master's student and two undergraduate students, actually, um, who have been working on um, applying computer vision to uh, new data sets. So they've taken what Nils has done. Nils found that computer vision was particularly good at identifying something called xenophyophores, which are these sort of balls of mud. Um, and so um, my uh, master's student, Erin Brown, has been looking at training a model just to identify xenophyophores. And this summer, we took that model to sea and we took the live ROV feed, the live video feed from the seabed, plugged it into the computer, and the computer was identifying xenophyophores in real time, uh, near real time, as we went along. 
And so you can see what the computer's doing is drawing a box around something it thinks is a xenophire force, so it's spotting it. It says xeno, and then there's a little number next to it that's changing, and that number is, is um, how um, happy it is with its decision. So it's a measure of confidence. So you'll see it's sort of a percentage. I'm 70% sure this is a xenophire force. Now I'm 50% sure it is. Now I'm 100% sure it is. So that's what's going on there. Um, and so this was, this was really interesting work and gives us some, some really great things to play with in the future and some confidence that at some point we are going to be able to get to this live interpretation, live identification of animals, or at least some animals, um, so that that can speed up that whole process of collection of data. But actually what we definitely need is more data to train the models with in the first place. And this involves bringing people together from across the world to pool our resources so we have a big enough data sets to train these models. So we've been working with lots of different organizations across the world to try and bring image libraries together and developing standards in how we analyze our image data so that we can put data sets together and they're all speaking the same language. So put really simply, if I call something an enemy number one, someone else is calling it an enemy number one as well, not an enemy number 12. So then we can put all the data together and use it to train AI. Um, so AI is fantastic. We're going to continue working on that, but not to forget that it's not really about the AI. It's about generating the data to make be better maps. It's a means to an end for us um, and to improve the mo models that we have to make them more quantitative so we can start to think about ecosystem services and how um, these ecosystems are used for humans. Um, and I just want to finish on this slide, um, which many of you might know, we are now in the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So it runs from 2021, it began at the beginning of this year and runs till 2030. So this is a new 10 year program that is aimed at trying to provide the science we need to manage our oceans sustainably. So following on from the work where I started in the original census of marine life that was a 10 year program to explore the marine life of the ocean, we are now in a new 10 year program to explore deep sea life to help inform sustainable development. Um, and myself and, and many other colleagues from across the world have come together to create this project, Challenger 150, the sole purpose of which is to coordinate deep sea science globally towards a common objective of informing sustainable management of the ocean. So myself and my colleague Anna Hilario in Portugal um, co-lead this project under the UN decade. It's endorsed by the UN and we're really excited about the next 10 years and what we will hopefully able, be able to do to help save the planet. <laughs> and I'll finish there. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now is the opportunity for questions for Kerry. Um, we've got to take them through this, so just a minute. We can log on to it. Okay. So the, so the most popular questions come to the top. Okay. Are you ready? Given the geopolitical dominance of China and the poor, poor treatment of child miners in, in the DRC, are there circumstances where we should consider deep sea mining? That's a very good question. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, at the moment, um, there is this uh, push to mine the deep sea for minerals that are used, uh, metals that are used in almost all electronic devices um, and particularly batteries and are um, needed for moving to a, uh, a low carbon economy. And the argument being put forward by the industry is that we have to have these minerals in order to move to a low carbon economy. Um, and that may well be the case. I'm not a geologist. I don't know if these minerals can be found in other ways. But what I do know is that humans have a terrible history of doing something and asking questions later. The deep sea environment is extremely poorly known. And the area of the Clarion Clipperton Fracture Zone, which is where there is a lot of licenses I mentioned in my talk, Recent expeditions to that area have found that 90% of the species are new to science. New to science. We didn't even know they existed, let alone what they do, 
their role in the environment and the potential impacts on them of deep sea mining. So from my perspective, and I've always been really clear about this, I think we should spend some time understanding this system and very targeted research to understand the potential impacts of deep sea mining before we press ahead with deep sea mining. And, other, and it's, not for, um, it's not for science to make that decision. It's a societal decision whether we just choose to mine the deep sea or not. But from my perspective as a scientist, I do think it's wise to understand the impacts of what you're going to do before you attempt to do it. So then I've got two similar questions. One, I want to study this area. I'm a marine science MSc student. What should I do next? And we've got another similar one. What advice would you give someone who studied marine biology, was at a lengthy break and wants to return? Recommendations for courses. Oh, OK. Um, well, I think, I think the important thing to remember about deep sea science, if you're, if you're particularly interested in deep sea science, is actually you don't have to do a PhD or a master's in deep sea science because it's actually about the techniques more than anything else. So I use habitat mapping techniques, and you can use those in shallow water as well. Um, equally, if I'd gone back to my PhD, I was looking at diet and stomach dissection. You know, that doesn't have to be deep sea only. So actually, um, if you want to go into a career in deep sea, and particularly if you want to go into a research career, obviously with a research career you, you need to do a master's and a PhD, and that may involve doing a master's. Um, but I wouldn't fret if that PhD isn't necessarily in deep sea science, because actually there aren't that many PhDs in deep sea science. <laughs> but think more about the skills, think more about the area that you're interested in, and try to get the skills in that area, because they can be applied to deep sea. Um, okay, you don't have to do it strictly on deep sea. Um, and if, you're, if you've been out of marine science for a while and you want to come back in, um, there are... Wow, there are a lot of master's courses around in this, but I, if you're really interested in deep sea, um, there are a few universities that have specialists in deep sea. So we're one, Southampton's another, Newcastle have some wonderful deep sea people working there as well. Um, and so I'd, I'd have a look at what the staff do. That's kind of the most important thing. See who's researching deep sea uh, and, and look at what masters are offered in those universities. So we've got one from George Wolfe. Um, you're going to need to help the audience on what a CWC is. Because I'm Cold water coral. Cool. OK, thanks, George. <laughs> right. OK, so do you consider particulate organic matter, that's POM, uh, flux quality on cold water coral species as predicted stratification and poor food supply with acidification will stress cold water corals in the North Atlantic? Wow. Uh, thanks, George. I know, George. Thanks for that, George. Um, <laughs> So do I think that changes yeah, in look, POC, yeah. let me have yeah. a look, do you consider POM flux quality on that as predicted stratification and poor food supply with certification or stress growth? Yes, I do, George. No, I do. Uh, yeah, no, no, and, uh, no. I think, I think what George is saying is that, so, so we know under climate change and ocean acidification that the um, amount of, the, the timing of phytoplankton blooms, so these blooms of algae at the surface, and the, and the composition of those blooms is going to change, right? We know that. Um, and all the organisms in the deep sea are completely reliant upon that surface production for food, apart from the weirdos at hydrothermal vents and cold seeps. Um, and so that stuff snows down onto the deep sea as marine snow, and that's what everything feeds on. And as that um, plankton blooms, as they change under climate change, as ocean acidification affects the um, types of algae that are growing, um, the quality and the composition of that food going into the deep sea and the timing of it is going to change, right? And all these cold water corals feed on that stuff. And so, yes, George, they are going to be stressed, most certainly. Climate change is a real, is a real uh, I mean, it's a problem for everything. But you sort of think, oh, the deep sea is miles away. It's not going to affect the deep sea because the warming's maybe at the surface or whatever. But actually, um, that change in food supply is critical because the deep sea is a food-limited environment. It's completely reliant on the surface. And if surface stuff changes, everything down there is going to change in ways that we actually can't predict at the moment. OK, another one. Now, this is anon anonymous. How can you produce a meaningful habitat map for the whole world when habitats can change? <laughs> well, I mean, it, 
Change in what way? It depends what you're saying, I suppose. Um, I mean, the, the sea floor is the sea floor and the sediment type is the sediment type on the sea floor. I'm not sure in what way you think it can change. Ocean currents change, sure. Um, the, there are seasonal changes, but I mean, fundamentally, I mean, it's a bit like saying on land, how can you predict it? Well, you know, temperate forest is where temperate forest is, right? And, and that's not changing over any time scale soon, unless humans chop it down. Um, so there is a level at which you can predict habitats. Clearly, you can't have all the very minute detail, um, but you can still have uh, maps that are informative to decision making. And that's what this is really about. It's about being able to justify decisions on the basis of some clear, robust science as opposed to just going, I'll put an MPA there. Will sea temperature change alter Arctic Atlantic designations? And if so, how quickly are they changing? Oh, right. Well, um, I think that refers to the, 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 the split between Arctic and Atlantic fauna in, in UK waters. And will, will climate change change that? Yes, it most certainly will change that. Um, but part of the problem with understanding the impacts of climate change on deep sea systems, and, and probably actually arguably marine systems, but definitely deep sea, is that it requires monitoring data. Right? You, you need to monitor these sites to understand what changes are occurring so you can understand what's driving those changes. And long-term monitoring is just, I mean, just forget it. It doesn't happen in the deep sea. Um, there are a few sites globally where there are long-term monitoring programs going on. Porcupine uh, Abyssal Plain Observatory is one of them, known as PAP. There are a few others globally that are monitoring change, but not nearly enough to, for us to really be able to say we have observed change. Uh, and the other thing is, it, it, these things work on very, very long timescales as well. Um, so actually, we'd need at least 10 years worth of data to even think about being able to observe any changes. Um, and so until we start monitoring properly, um, that's going to remain a problem. And I think it's a problem in shallow water. And I actually think it's a problem terrestrially as well. <laughs> My husband's nodding. Yes, we don't monitor. So George Wolfe says, great answer, Kerry. Thanks. Um, so <laughs> Thanks, George. Then, then we've got an, a nice question from Rebecca who says, what do you think are the things normal people can do to try to protect the marine environment? So I'm, I'm suggesting you're abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> what can normal people do? Uh, well, I... Oh, wow. God, there's loads of things you can do. Um, so in your everyday lives, there are always things you can do. And they may be small things or they may be big things. Um, but I would always advocate try and do something. So, you know, there's the obvious things like, um, you know, don't take the elevator when you're going up the stairs if you are able to walk up the stairs. That's reducing your electricity consumption, um, which is reducing the burden on climate change, which is reducing the burden on the marine environment. So, you know, th there's lots of really simple things you can do. I would say try and reduce your energy. <laughs> your energy consumption is probably the biggest thing every one of us can do. Um, there are things you won't be able to do, but there are some simple things like, like you know, take the stairs, not the elevator, if you can. Um, you think it doesn't make a difference, but what you, what you don't realise is there are so many people in the world and each tiny little thing that everyone does soon adds up to a massive change. So, you know, if you, you've probably all heard the stories about people taking the, 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 the point naught 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 pence off of, off of bank accounts and suddenly they were billionaires, right? And that's exactly how change works, is each one of us does a little thing but there are so many of us that it builds into a huge change and makes a massive difference. So I would say whatever you feel you can do, do, but don't do nothing. Don't feel so overpowered by it all that you feel like, well, there's no point in me doing anything. No, there is always a point to you doing something. So do whatever you're capable of doing. Think about what you do in your life and things you think, actually, I could probably not do that or I could do it in a different way that would be better. There was one <laughs> that I really liked, and now it's disappeared. <laughs> it wasn't popular. Um, okay, no, no, it's here. I, I'm going to elevate it so it stays at the top. Do uh, chairs base, prerogative? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I shut it to the top without finding it again. Uh, do you complement your in situ data with in invasive methods like trawling or coring for these maps, or do you can you predict the the sort of yeah. well, they call it endofauna? I think of it as infauna, but whatever yeah. stuff that lives in the sediment from similar habitats. No, so. So the work we do is all epifaunal focused. So it's animals that live on the seabed, not in it. 
Um, and we do do ground truthing, but we use the robots for that. So we use imaging and we're increasingly using imaging, mostly because we're working in quite sensitive habitats. Um, there are parts of the world, though, where the only data they're able to get is, is as bycatch from the fishing industry and fishing trawls. So particularly in the South Atlantic and in developing nations where the, the monitoring that's going on is, is fisheries monitoring and it's really about fish and people's livelihoods. But they're able to keep hold of the bycatch of invertebrates and that tells them something about the animals that are there. And so that can be used to ground truth. But we, 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 we do tend not to trawl anymore for these maps. We, we, we very much use imaging technologies. For the infaunal animals, the things that live in the sediment, we don't make predictive models of those. And that's really because the in-fauna is really, really driven by sediment type and grain size. That's the single most important thing to them. I mean, apart from depth and, and um, temperature and the obvious things. And we can't predict sediment grain size. I showed you that map of the UK sediment types. Um, and that, you know, if you looked at it really closely, you can see it's, it's really coarse, right? It, it's not a great map at all. It's very, very general. And for the whole of the world, I mean, just forget it. There are sediment maps for the whole of the world, but they're ridiculous. Um, so we, we wouldn't even attempt to predict infaunal organisms, to be honest. If you had decent data on sediment type, you could do it, but, but we don't, so we don't. <laughs> I like this one from Adrian. What's the coolest thing you've ever seen in the deep sea? Oh, there's too many. The brine pool was really cool. Um, the brine pool was cool. The incredible bioluminescence on the way down was cool. It was like a firework display. It was actually cooler than the brine pool in many ways. Um, I've seen weird cobweb structures. Under, I've, I've seen underwater cobweb. And that was very recently, and that was very strange. Um, I've seen a shark nursery. I don't know, hundreds of sharks swimming around. Shark eggs all over the floor. Incredible place. Um, the cold water coral reefs you see are, are just blow your mind. I don't ever get tired of seeing them. And every time you come up on a new one, you just go, wow. We saw one that was completely purple. It was covered in this amazing purple soft coral, but it grew like a like moss, really. It had grown all throughout the coral reef, and it just made the whole reef purple. It was amazing. Um, yeah, there's, there's too many. Those are the things that come to mind. But it's, it's really incredible, and I feel very, very privileged that I get to see these things. And I really like sharing the video and the imagery with people because I really want everyone else to see it and think it's as cool as I do. How often do you encounter a new species in your work? All the time. <laughs> All the time. I think every time we go out, I, I, I think it's fair to say, every time we go out, we find something new. It might be very similar to a thing we already knew about, um, but it's slightly different. Um, in the North Atlantic, the rate of species discovery is, is much slower because we've explored it quite a lot and I tend to work in the North Atlantic. But you, you heard earlier I was saying about the Clarion Clippert in the Pacific, really poorly studied, 90% of the species new to science. So there's a huge amount out there left to discover, but species description is really time consuming. There aren't enough taxonomists in the world, that's the people who describe species. Um, Taxonomy has been incredibly undervalued for years um, but actually the naming of species is one of the most fundamental and important things that you can do. Uh, and I, I really wish people understood that. Um, it is not regarded as cutting edge science, apparently, describing species, but it is nevertheless fundamental to everything that we do. Um, so yeah, we, we see new species all the time, but unfortunately don't get to name them most of the time. <laughs> so one from Fiona Ware at National Museum Scotland. Wonderful to see the seas map. We have this fantastic collection of benthic fauna at the National Museums of Scotland available to borrow for research. Fab! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks! <laughs> no, that, that's great. And me, museums are amazing. I, I, I worked in Cardiff Museum, National Museum, Museum of Wales in Cardiff, um, and they're incredible places uh, in terms of the science they do and the specimens they hold and the value of those specimens to people. Um, you know, I used that, that collection for my PhD and was able to do all kinds of science on that collection um, to try and understand more about the starfish in the deep sea. So, yeah, I, I'm a firm, firm supporter of <laughs> museum collections. I think they're brilliant. They, they keep going, and I guess we're going to need to draw it to a close at some time. But do you think that sustainable development is ever going to be more than a myth? Yes. 
or I would give up now. <laughs> no, I do. Because actually, if you look at, if you look at, the, I mean, the mere fact that we get funded to look at these things tells you that the governments and internationally, people are aware of the problem and are taking steps. Now, you know, you could be really depressed about it and say it's not happening quickly enough, which it isn't. Um, but I do think things are moving in the right direction. It's just incredibly slow. It's glacial. But, you know, it is moving. Um, and I do think by the end of 2030, you will be able to have seen a slight shift. And that's really important. Um, don't lose hope. <laughs> so I'm just going to go off piste. If there's anyone in the audience that doesn't slide out and you've got a question, put your hand up now. And what we'll do is we'll repeat it for those online. Yeah, I've got one back there. Yeah. Um, as as the, um, just the yell it out and I will repeat it. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so you're asking about whether the change in fisheries policy is going to um, help with conserving the marine environment. Um, I don't know. I mean, what, what worried me most about the whole thing, and I'm still worried about, is that all of the environmental legislation was made at a European level. So the Habitats Directive, which has been a core part of conservation policy in the UK for such a long time, it was a European level directive. Um, and at the moment, I think it has been transposed into UK law. Thank you, Abby, he's nodding. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it has been transposed into UK law. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I hope that those policies that were already in place are not now watered down as a result of this, that they are in fact strengthened. But I don't know which way it's gonna go. Um, I'd be interested in my colleagues' opinions who work more closely with government than I do now. <laughs> okay. Is that, yeah, is that, is that, is that a hand? Yeah, yes, go on. Is. Yell it out and carry on, repeat it. Yeah. Um, what are the limitations of the protected area approach? And are there any more kind of generic approaches that you would like to take? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so the question's about the limitations of the, of the protected area approach. And the, the obvious limitation is on mobile species. So protected areas can work for mobile species if you're protecting important food gra feeding grounds or nursery grounds. Um, but anything that moves around a static protected area is, is um, maybe not the only form of protection needed. Um, the other way in which they're a bit tricky is, is under climate change. The important areas for animals are going to shift as our climate changes. And so we need a mechanism for thinking about shifting uh, these protected areas as well. But yeah, protected areas alone absolutely will not solve the problems. They, they are one tool in a toolbox. You know, if you got rid of all the fisheries legislation tomorrow and just had protected areas, we'd be in a lot of trouble. So you do still need other measures in place. Um, and where fisheries are concerned, it's things like limitations on, on um, technical limitations on gear sizes and soap times and mesh sizes. Um, on issues relating to um, oil and gas industry around pollution, for example. You know, an MPA is not going to help with pollution. That's a, a movable feast. So you need other measures in place on dis what you can discharge, levels of pollution, these sorts of things. So, yeah, it's, it, they cannot work alone, ever, I don't think. <laughs> so I think we probably need to draw things to a close because I think the questions are standing between us and... I mean, no doubt there's, uh, you know, espresso martini and all sorts of wonderful things out there for us. But there's, there's just a couple of comments that I thought were really nice. Thank you. You're a true inspiration. Aww. And then uh, thank you for a valuable, fascinating and erudite presentation. Certainly a golden opportunity for any future David Attenboroughs. <laughs> Not sure if that's a hint. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Professor you. Kerry Howe. Thank you. <laughs>